This week on Jerusalem Dateline. I'm very angry uh, about it. But it's, it's absolutely not helpful what's now going on in, uh, in, in different parliaments of, uh, of Europe. How a symbolic gesture is giving momentum to the push for a Palestinian state. And under the helmet, our sneak peek at the documentary that takes you inside the world of the Israeli Defense Forces. Plus, stacking the deck, how the mainstream media overlook Palestinian abuses while pinning the target on Israel. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell coming to you this week from our U.S. studio. The world is willing to spend billions of dollars to rebuild the Gaza Strip, even though Hamas started this summer's war with Israel. The head of the U.N. visited both sides this week, condemning Israel and calling for peace talks to resume. As Julie Stahl reports, some international Christian parliamentarians say he's got it all wrong. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon took a first-hand look at Hamas tunnels that intended terror attacks on Israeli communities. I was uh, shocked and alarmed by this underground tunnel which had been used for penet penetration for terrorist uh, purpose. I have been repeatedly uh, condemning uh, this rocket attacks by Hamas from the air. Ban made his comments in the Israeli kibbutz Nirim, where he met with the family of Daniel Turgeman. A Hamas mortar attack launched from a UN school killed the four-year-old. We told the Secretary General that Daniel was killed in his home by a mortar bomb that was fired from his school. Um, in that school were staying at the time refugees um, that Hamas was willingly putting in danger while firing from them, from there to civilian targets. Daniel's aunt, Maya Turgeman, told CBN News the UN must do what it's meant to do. That is protect human rights. And protecting human rights means standing and saying that Hamas is a terrorist organization, not looking for peace, that they target civilians. During a visit to Gaza, Ban condemned Israel for striking UN properties during the summer conflict he mentioned the U.N. investigation of Israel, but didn't say anything about investigating Hamas. In Jerusalem, Christian members of the International Israel Allies Caucus called for the U.N. to act. The conflict, the rockets, the barrage, the total disregard for human rights on either side of the border that Hamas represents, rightly labeled a terrorist organization in our view, you cannot negotiate with people who embrace terrorism as an end to their means. That call came a day after British lawmakers voted to recognize a Palestinian state. The move doesn't change foreign policy, but provides symbolic support to the Palestinian push for statehood. I'm very angry uh, about it. But it's, it's absolutely not helpful what's now going on in, uh, in, in different parliaments of, uh, of Europe. For it's, um, it's, it's saying to the Palestinians, Violence is the good way. It's, it's, it's helping the, the jihadists. I saw it among Latin America already. They have been a lot of countries who recognize the Palestinian Authority. And now, one year later, two years later, they have been having a lot of trouble in their countries. And they uh, want now to, to reverse their decisions. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. The international community often accuses Israel's soldiers of committing war crimes. Now a new film reveals the untold story and puts a human face on the IDF. I'm Eden. I'm almost 21. I'm an officer with the paratroopers. I have a platoon with 40 soldiers, and we have eight months to train them. Beneath the Helmet is a feature-length documentary, taking the viewer inside the world of those in the Israel Defense Forces. The film chronicles eight months in the training of new paratrooper recruits. As the world often slams the IDF and its tactics, beneath the helmet puts a human face on what many see as the most moral fighting force in the world. It's a crucible. It's a, it's a rite of passage, and all Israeli teenagers go through it. It's a little bit scary to take a gun in my hands. It's like, not uh, for kids. It can uh, really hurt someone. But the noise and the boom is... It's very different than a computer game. Israeli boys and girls are drafted at the end of high school. 
Producer Rebecca Shore says that makes Israeli youth grow up fast. So there's something that happens between the ages of 18 and 21 uh, that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. When you see like all the guys jumping and you're like the only guy standing in the plane, it's your turn three seconds and like saying jump. There are other things that make the IDF unique. Chances are that when you're an Israeli soldier, you're going to see some sort of conflict because that's how it goes here. The Israeli soldiers are literally defending their homes and their families. This is a switch, it seems to me, that they made last week where they now understand that the fate of the country is in their hands. Still, these soldiers can regularly go home on weekends, involving family in a unique way. I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm actually happy of doing his laundry because, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're so happy that they come home and they come home safe that we're willing to do anything, just, you know. This is basically the end of the beginning. By this time next week, they'll find themselves protecting the northern border of Israel. Aviv Regev recently finished his army service. As a commander at age 23, he took responsibility for the lives of 120 soldiers. These are soldiers from the whole variety of Israel's society, from the top notch, from the bottom. Not even all of them are Jewish. We have some uh, desert nomads, Druze, Muslims, Christians. Is it a moral army? I sleep with a clear conscience at night, knowing that every time me and my soldiers stuck to the utmost highest moral values, human rights, international law. With anti-Israel sentiment in the world today, Shore expects the film to stir up debate. The minute you say Israeli soldier, it's almost like a dirty word, as crazy as that is. This is going to be seen as controversial, even though it's a totally apolitical and human story. Yes, we're prepared for the conflict. Shore says they hope young people will better understand what Israelis their age face and the threats that surround their homeland. Coming up, why does the media show Israeli military operations, yet rarely airs images of Palestinian fighters? Find out when we return. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. Did you ever wonder why the media seems biased against Israel? Recently, we talked with Mati Friedman, a former AP reporter, on how the mainstream media presents a skewed version of Israel. Well, Mati, thanks for joining us here on uh, Jerusalem Dateline. Uh, you wrote an article called The Insider's Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. Why did you write it? As a correspondent for a long time for, for the AP, which is one of the biggest news organizations in the world, um, I realized by the end of my time there that something had badly malfunctioned in press coverage of, mm -hmm. of Israel. Um, and as an Israeli, it was a uh, deep, deep concern to me. And it kind of came to a head uh, this summer because of the events in Gaza and right. because of the way those events were covered and the outrage that, mm -hmm. um, that it sparked abroad. And I decided at the end of the summer to write an essay looking at what has gone wrong through the lens of my own experiences. So when you watched the coverage of the Gaza war over the, uh, over the summer, what bothered you? Uh, if you look at the staffing in the mainstream mm -hmm. media organizations, um, this conflict is covered as if it were the most important story on earth. That's why the title of my essay is An Insider's mm -hmm. Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. When I started working for the AP in 2006, um, the AP had more than 40 full-time news staffers covering Israel and the Palestinians. Um, which is 12 million people, more yeah. or less, which was more than they had covering uh, China, which is 1.3 billion people. Uh, they had at the same time one part-time staffer in Syria. So Israel mm -hmm. was more than 40 times as important as Syria. When the Gaza fighting erupted this summer, 700 journalists flew to Israel to cover the fighting on top of all the permanent correspondents mm -hmm. who are already here, which is one of the largest press contingents on earth. In Mexico between 2006 and 2012, 60,000 people died in, in drug wars along the U.S. border, um, and that was covered far less. The mainstream press corps here has largely adopted an advocacy role. They've decided to play a political role in the conflict. Um, they've decided to lobby for the side that they think is right, and political decisions are disguised as journalistic decisions. And I give examples of that mm -hmm. in my essay, and I think we saw that very much uh, this summer where the war, because that's what it was, was portrayed as a one-sided Israeli aggression against innocent people in, mm -hmm. in Gaza, which was a picture that is false. In the war itself, what were some of the examples that you can cite? I think any observer looking at 
Gaza at these recurring rounds in Gaza understands that Hamas has a very smart strategy. It's a ruthless strategy, but it is highly effective. The strategy is to terrorize Israeli civilians using rockets, provoke an Israeli response, put civilians in Gaza in between the Israelis and the Hamas fighters by storing weapons, uh, storing rockets in civilian basements, in the basements of mosques, in schools. And we've seen all those things documented this summer. And then having the huge international media contingent in Gaza film the civilian casualties, not the armed right. men, and use those pictures to spark outrage against Israel abroad. And that will um, prevent Israel from, from acting uh, to the full extent of its mm -hmm. strength against Hamas. That's the strategy I think any intelligent person can see it. And yet it's not covered like that. So do readers around the world get a skewed version of what's actually happening here? Absolutely. I think readers are getting a one-sided morality play, mm -hmm. um, kind of another morality play from the Holy Land, uh, the kind of thing that's programmed, I think, deep into the Western DNA, where it becomes a story of, not a story of a tiny minority enclave of six million Jews in an Arab world of 300 million mm -hmm. people and an Islamic world of one billion people, um, not the story of a country that uh, exists on 0.2% of the landmass of the Arab world. What you're getting is a story of Jewish moral failure. The, the story is, if you read between the lines and if you read the lines themselves, the story is that Israel is faced with a clear moral choice and is making the wrong choice. Israel could have peace, but it chooses war. Um, that story is, is false. In the last part of your uh, article, you allude to that and uh, the reasons. Why are the reasons for that? A few different things are going mm -hmm. on here. Some of them are quite mundane. Right. Um, some of them have to do with the bureaucracies of large organizations. There are a lot of reporters here. And when you have a lot of reporters, they need to have something to do, else someone might notice that they don't have anything to do and someone might fire them. <laughs> of course, as journalists, you probably uh, get that. Um, yeah. Another aspect of it is that this is a really easy story to report, and reporters don't like to admit it. But when you're here, you get to cover a conflict. You can be in the field 10 o'clock in the morning in a flak jacket having yourself filmed, and by 3 o'clock, you'll be back mm -hmm. um, in a safe, liberal city like Tel Aviv um, or here in Jerusalem, you know, drinking, drinking beers inside a security bubble provided to you by the soldiers mm -hmm. um, right. who you might have uh, just that morning been uh, implying were, were war criminals. The obsession develops around Jews. Mm -hmm. and you can't discuss this place without admitting that this is the world's only Jewish country. Now, if you look at the West, I mean, you'll see that the sins that animate people in the West, and especially liberals in the West, are colonialism, militarism, and racism. And certainly those characteristics exist in the United States and in all societies. But the country that has been selected to serve as the example of those sins is the Jewish country. And I think that that's a direct descendant of very old uh, thinking about Jewish people. Mati, thanks so much for being with us and, uh, and for your article. Thank you for having me on your show, Chris. Up next, celebrating kosher cooking. A look at the delicious meals Jews are making at this special time of year. <music> Jews around the world recently celebrated the week-long Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot. During that time, Jewish people talk about the seven species of the Bible. CBN Scott Ross went to Jerusalem for a cooking course using those seven superfoods of Scripture. This is the city of David. My wife Nedra and I met a famous Israeli known as the Queen of Kosher and the Kosher Rachel Ray. She is Jamie Geller, mother of five and founder of the Kosher Media Network. How large an area does this encompass? It's an 11-acre area. This is biblical Jerusalem, the city of David. And you'll notice it's outside of the old city walls, right? right? So the city of David, Jerusalem, Israel, it brings people together, it does. much like food. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to show you one of my favorite recipes, <laughs> the seven superfoods of the Bible and a special salad. How about that? Great. I brought Nedra along because she's the real cook in the family. She feeds me. She's a very good cook, but yeah. but we know nothing about kosher food and, and kosher cooking. Kosher refers to biblical and traditional Jewish dietary laws. They prohibit some foods like pork and shellfish, 
and don't allow mixing meat and dairy products in the same meal. But we learned it's tasty all the same. The way that I cook is quick and kosher, okay? Right. So that means it's easy, anyone can do it, and all I need are people that like to eat. We love to eat. You do that? Okay, we, yeah. Okay, fine. And what's special here, forget about kosher, we're doing a recipe inspired by the seven species. The seven foods that are superfoods, superfoods of the Bible and of the land of Israel. Superfoods? Yeah. Will this make me a super person, man? It'll make man? you strong like Popeye, it'll make you healthy, your <laughs> doctor will be happy, your wife will be happy, you'll eat good. The seven species come from the book of Deuteronomy, which says the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. Shivat Haminim, which translates to mean the seven species. So this is the Shivat Haminim salad. Okay, okay. fine. So we're going to start by our wheat that we're going to use is bulgur. So would you mind to help me, Adrian? Sure, what would you yeah. like me to do? Just put, put that right in here. In. And yes, into a hot pot, we're going to put a little bit of oil, just a touch. You make bulgur like you would rice. So you toast it up just a little, little bit in a hot pot. Okay. Now, okay. this is the magic of television, right? Okay. We right. got a finished thing right there. We okay? did it. Before we get to toss it all together, we're gonna make our dressing. So you wanna help a little bit, Scott and Edra? Here, we have olive oil. Okay, do you want the whole? Please, put it all in. <laughs> okay, this is a little Dijon mustard. That's Love just for a little Dijon. flavor, right? Loves mustard. Like right, that. okay, fine. Okay. So Dijon's good. Now, what we have here is one of the special foods of the lands of Israel. Date honey. Dates are one of the sweetest fruits in the world. Tons of fiber, that's what we're talking about, these superfoods. And date honey has been used for thousands of years to sweeten things naturally. A little red wine vinegar, right? Because okay. grapes and I wine, can do that. you can do it. We got a little bit of, right, salt and pepper. Okay, now we whisk. Who wants to whisk for we me? We can whisk. Okay, whisk, whisk it up. Well, Mr. Ross. Okay, okay gorgeous. How you long do you whisk? That's it. Yeah, it's good, emulsified, nice, so everything's emulsified. You don't want to see any chunks of, uh, Dijon anymore, yeah. so that just pulls that together. So now, before we assemble our salad, I just want to show you, right, this is dry dates. Okay. And then no. you just slice your dates like this. Okay. Okay, so that's how we deal with our dates. You can use fresh or dried figs, but I just wanted to show you guys a little okay, bit of that. Okay, good. Would you please, Scott, bring over the, the beautiful, this, beautiful serving yes. plate. Then we can set right. our bulgur, right, is going to right. be the base of our salad. Right. So we're going to put on our dates. They're a little, little sticky. So you'll excuse me, you want to help me? Okay. Okay. I put okay. in the grapes, the superfood okay. of the grapes, right? They've got lots of antioxidants. When pomegranates are in season, we would use the seeds of a pomegranate. Here we've got oh. our figs, another one, right? right? Right out of the Bible, onto our beautiful They look salad. like anchovies. Right, you said that. That's <laughs> not one of the superfoods, but no. if we can put it on, you know? So we pour on our dressing on top, right? Okay. And it's beautiful, right? It's a nice yeah, salad. Yeah, really nice. But now look at it. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Right? <laughs> wow. They think you're the in the kitchen. The power of a little hour. green. Yeah, totally. It looks like we worked hard on this. Yeah. How long did that take us, guys? Uh, five minutes. Okay, would you like to taste? Of course. Okay, so let's share this together, right? Okay. Shall we? A little for you. Okay. A little more hearty. They've got a spoon over there. Okay. A little for you, Miss Nedra. Thank you, dear. I want you to get Boy, all of the superfoods. It smells nice, I, yeah. it's fresh. So shall we? Yes, we shall. Okay. God bless this and help me. Amen. Mmm. <laughs> Do you like? Mmm. It's different, right? Enjoy, enjoy. I'm so happy that you like. And right now you're eating a superfood salad with foods from the Bible that's delicious and good for you. So like mm. that's like the best combination. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, I wanted to give you guys a present. Can I do that? Sure. Sure. Okay. I have a new book. Wonderful. Called Joy of Kosher, Fast Fresh Family Recipes. I may end up going so kosher, you never know. <laughs> well, you know what? You don't have to be kosher yeah, to right. love kosher. I understand so that, in right, theory, yeah. this was a kosher salad, but come on, it was right. delicious, right. you know? It looks beautiful. And there are lots of wonderful Israeli recipes in here, hummus, falafel, um, there's a, a lamb kebab spiced with cinnamon, oh, cumin. Right. And so don't be scared it's kosher, don't be scared it's Israel, don't be right. scared. You know, I try Italian recipes, I try Indian recipes, right. I try, let's do it, let's yeah. get together around food. We can come Scott Ross, CBN News, Jerusalem. Up next, camping out in a sukkah. We visit some real life tabernacles where Israelis celebrate the feast. For thousands of years, Jewish people around the world have celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. They do it by following the biblical instruction to live in temporary dwellings, like tents. Julie Stahl visited one of those sukkahs to see how it brings the Jewish people closer to God, who some call Hashem. 
It's an ancient biblical commandment that's still being kept today. Some call it a Jewish camping trip, but with the conveniences of home. Shalom. Hi, shalom. Welcome. Shalom. We're so glad thank to you. have you here with us in our sukkah. Yes, thank you. We're here in our sukkah, which is really the, the home away from homes for this whole week of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Like many Israelis and Jewish people around the world, Seth and Teina Ben Chaim build a sukkah or booth on the back porch of their Jerusalem apartment every year. It helps us remember, first of all, we're commanded to remember the exodus from Egypt and how we needed to uh, wander through the desert for 40 years without permanent dwellings. But it also reminds us that even though we've been brought into the land of Israel, we haven't reached our final destination. So tell us about the sukkah itself. What, what do you, how do you make a sukkah? And the main thing is that it's a roof that will uh, make us feel that we're open to the elements. Uh -huh. And then and we why need to, is that? well, uh, because otherwise we'd be in the protection of our homes in some ways. And, uh, and we're supposed to be in this flimsy tabernacle uh, so that we can remember that ultimately we're under Hashem's uh, protection. Most sukkahs are decorated at least in part by the children. Families eat, sleep, study, and play together in their temporary houses for a whole week. Despite the camping conditions, it's considered a joyful time. And, and you can focus on the real important things like relationships and, uh, and just sitting down and studying the Word and talking with the, the children about God's faithfulness. Jonathan and his sister Rebecca enjoy the holiday so much, Jonathan made his treehouse into a sukkah. This for Sukkot. This for Sukkot. And that too. That's very pretty. So you decorated your sukkah up here. Yes. Wow. Another part of the Sukkot celebration, recorded in Leviticus 23, is bringing a special fruit and branches to rejoice before the Lord. We offer them to Hashem, all four of these, in our uh, prayers. Every morning we wave them in many different directions and we, uh, we really look to above. And that's what this type of roof helps us remember too, is we're looking to above because that's where our help is going to come from. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. We'll see you next week in Jerusalem.